So welcome to today's webinar. It's the uh, part two of what we talked about last month, which was our basic um, principles of infection prevention and control. So um, I do want to just uh, cover a couple of more housekeeping items. Um, first of all, you probably don't see my name as the host. You see Paula Parsons, but I'm in the room with Paula. And so those of you who know Paula know she's our, our coordinator and she does a fantastic job. So if you're trying to reach me, um, you can just click on Paula's name and it will get to me as well. The other thing is, I know you can't see it on the slide, but um, and, and Mary Beth already mentioned this, but please, if you want to send a question or a comment, um, do, do choose all participants. Like, uh, for whatever reason, if, you, if it says all attendees or anyone else, there's a real good chance that I, as the host or the presenter, can't see your question. So if, if you've chatted something in and you haven't heard back from me, um, it may, just check that to make sure it says all participants. But Mary Beth, our producer, is going to help us on that end as well. So just take that moment to make sure you have the right selection. All right, so you guys know us. We're Qualys Health. Um, so we're doing the presentation today, and we are the quality improvement consultant for Washington and I have not consultant, quality improvement organization for Washington and Idaho. Okay, so today we're going to cover, um, last time we talked about the basic principles, but today we want to focus on what is your role as an infection preventionist? Because in any healthcare setting, obviously we all have that responsibility, whether it's the infection preventionist or the RN on the front line or the healthcare provider or the patient or the ancillary staff, we all have responsibilities for infection prevention. But um, as the infection preventionist in your setting, you do have some special responsibilities. And so we're gonna try to cover those um, with regard to what we covered last time, so not the whole spectrum, but just on those basic infection prevention measures like transmission-based precautions, hand hygiene, and so forth. So hopefully, at the end of this webinar, you'll be able to review your own policies and know what the minimum standards need to be in there and where to find those resources. Um, and that includes being able to read those CDC guidelines and interpreting them so that you know what is applicable and you should be putting in your policy. And then um, as we walk through these slides, we're going to be talking about how to do self-assessments and collecting that data as you go forward so that you can begin to um, do real data-driven infection prevention um, for your risk assessment and for performance improvement. So just a little bit of review. Last time we talked about the chain of infection, um, and as I said before, um, this, I think, is an underappreciated concept. Um, anytime I've done an outbreak investigation, I've always kind of gone back to, to this chain to kind of figure out where should we start looking. So um, don't dismiss this out of hand. Uh, the other thing we talked about in depth was the standard and transmission-based precautions, including management of multidrug-resistant organisms. Um, and in there, if you remember, we talked about hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, cough etiquette, respiratory etiquette, some of the environmental practices and safe injection practices, and then, of course, isolation precautions. Um, so, again, let's talk about what your role is as the infection preventionist with regard to um, what we just reviewed. First advice I can give you is that you really need to know what the guidelines are and what the best practices are as well. And so throughout this presentation, you'll see links uh, to the current CDC HICPAC guidelines or other sources that are um, those, those documents that you really want to be able to get to pretty quickly. You need to read through them and understand what they say. Um, you also need to know what your own policies say and are they consistent with those guidelines. So um, if you haven't already done so, you need to figure out which policies are infection prevention and um, get started on reviewing those. Sometimes it can be overwhelming. I understand that. I've been in that role. Um, but it's so important, um, especially when the guidelines change. Now, you'll see some of these CDC guidelines are fairly old, I mean, as old as 2002. But they do occasionally change, and you need to make sure that your policies um, are, reflect those changes. We're going to talk today about different ways that you want to monitor compliance and your outcomes. So what, what metrics are you trying to um, collect data for and calculate, and then 
looking at that and how do you assess risk. So this is a cycle and you can jump in at any point, but you see how they're all related. So not only do you know what your best practices are, but you're reviewing your policies you are doing these gap analyses, you're monitoring for compliance and adherence, and all of that feeds into your risk assessment to know do you, do you need resources to prioritize closing some of those gaps? How do you educate your folks to those best standards? And then where do you need to improve performance? So if you keep that cycle in mind as we go through this, I think it will be very helpful to understand your, your specific role. Okay, so Mary Beth, we have a quiz, a poll, so you'll see this come up. So as we get started, um, most healthcare associated pathogens are transmitted patient to patient via A, improper isolation practices, B, inadequate sterilization of medical instruments, C, the hands of healthcare personnel, or D, ineffective disinfection of medical devices. So if you'll take a minute um, and select the answer that you think is best for this particular question, we will see what our results are. All right. So again, you, um, most healthcare-associated pathogens transmitted patient to patient. And we talked a lot about these, all of these options in our last webinar, but there's a special one we're looking for. Okay, let's see what let's see what most of our folks think. So I think we have is this a thirty second poll? Four more seconds. Okay, thank you. Oh, we have great infection preventionists in this audience. So you are correct. Hands of healthcare personnel is uh, the the number one culprit for transmitting pathogens patient to patient. So with that note, let's talk about hand hygiene. Now this, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about hand hygiene, um, not because I want to spend a lot of time on hand hygiene, but the way we approach as infection preventionists measuring and monitoring hand hygiene applies to the the other topics as well. But here are the guidelines, the primary guidelines that you'll be interested in. The CDC guidelines, so if you and your hospital say, we follow the CDC guidelines for hand hygiene, this is the document that you're talking about. It comes out of a morbidity and mortality weekly report, the MMWR from 2002. This is the link to it. Um, you may follow the World Health Organization guidelines that are more recent. They came out in 2009. Um, what you'll see on there is the, the guidelines are very similar to each other. The levels of evidence for World Health Organization are a little bit different. And I think that's because between 2002 and 2009, we actually had more studies get published supporting or not supporting some of those recommendations. Then the other thing you probably want to look at is this Joint Commission Hand Hygiene Monograph. It's avail available for free, so even if you're not a Joint Commission accredited hospital, you do have access to it. It's very large. The focus of this is on how to measure hand hygiene adherence, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, how they compare the guidelines that are out there. But um, do download it, take a look at it. It's got some good information. And um, the other thing is that if you have trouble sleeping at night, this may be the cure for you because it's pretty dry reading. So let's talk about those levels of evidence that I just mentioned. Anytime you have a CDC HICPAC guideline, they're going to give you levels of evidence. And they're listed out here, Category 1A, which is strongly recommended for implementation and strongly supported in the literature um, by, again, experimental design, um, randomized clinical trials and so forth. Category 1B is also strongly recommended for implementation. It's less supported by the evidence, but it is still recommended. Category 1C um, are required by some federal or state agency. Generally what we'll see is requirements by OSHA, that's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. You also see Category 2, which is suggestion for implementation, but the, the evidence for it is a little bit sketchy. But in general, I think it's a really good idea. And then you'll see no recommendation, meaning that the issue at hand has been un, is unresolved currently, that there's, there's insufficient evidence. Um, so when you are reviewing your policy 
and you say, for example, we follow CDC guidelines or World Health Organization guidelines, that means that at a minimum, your policy should have all of the 1A, 1B, and 1C recommendations in your policy. That is the minimum set of national guidelines that you must have. You can, on the category two, you really, really should have those in your policy as well, unless, unless you have a peer-reviewed study that shows something else that you want to put in your policy. In that case, you can cite that for those category two guidelines. In the category of items that are unresolved, you do not have to put that in your policy. In fact, you may not want to, um, unless it's something your, your organization is currently doing and it is not associated with harm to the patients. So um, you want to look those over pretty carefully. But again, at a minimum, category 1A, 1B, 1C needs to be cut and pasted right into your policy. And that's true for hand hygiene. That's true for personal protective equipment. It's true for anything that has um, a HIC pack or a CDC recommendation with levels of ev evidence associated with it. Um, the other thing I want to caution you about writing policies is don't overwhelm your staff. I mean, you really want to make sure that your policies can be followed. Um, the one thing that will get you in trouble with surveyors faster than anything is not so much that you're not following national guidelines, but that you're not following your own written policies. So keep that in mind as you're developing and writing policies. So let's take a look at some of those examples of the 1A, 1B, 1C. Um, this comes out of that MMWR. These are the CDC guidelines. Um, and I, they're, obviously, they're not all of them, but I wanted to get some examples so you could see each one of these. But that first one, 1A, do not add soap to partially empty soap dispensers. Very good evidence supporting that statement. So we do know that those soap dispensers get contaminated pretty quickly, and um, it is not recommended. 1B, decontaminate hands before having direct contact with patients. We've known that for a long time, a lot of evidence supporting that. Now look at this third one. The level of evidence is 1C, wear gloves when contact with blood or other potentially infectious materials um, could occur. So there probably is quite a lot of evidence supporting that, but this is an OSHA standard, and therefore it's required of all employers, and it's listed as a 1C. So you really do need to have this, this statement or something worded very, very similar in your own policy. The next one is decontaminate hands after contact with inanimate objects in the immediate vicinity of the patient. It's a level two, so it's suggested by CDC for implementation. It is recommended, but the levels of evidence are not quite clear. So again, if you have if you have other peer-reviewed literature that supports a, a different practice, you may want to consider that in, in this case. And again, um, the no recommendation, for example, in this example is um, regarding wearing rings in the healthcare setting. So you do not necessarily have to put that into your policy unless that really is your practice at your hospital. The other thing you'll need to know as an infection preventionist is measuring hand hygiene. Now, every one of you is doing this uh, because it was a national patient safety goal a few years back and everybody had to kind of get on board. But I will, I will say that as an experienced infection preventionist, measuring hand hygiene is not as easy as everyone thinks that it is. And I want to just caution all of you that when you are designing your hand hygiene measurement, you really need to think about the goals of your organization and what it is you're trying to measure. There's so many different reasons. I mean, are you, are you really trying to improve individual performance? Are you just trying to check the box to say that we measure hand hygiene because, you know, you're going to be surveyed sometime in the next year? Maybe that is the reason you're doing it. Um, you know, maybe you're, you've put some performance improvement changes in place and you really want to see if you've had an impact. Um, so that's a, that's a totally legitimate reason to start measuring or continue to measure hand hygiene. So there's a lot of different reasons, but you really want to know why you're doing it and who your audience is and what the purpose of the data is, how is it going to be used. So that will help you design your, your measuring system. 
So that brings to the next question. If you know why you're measuring, then you start to ask your question, well, what exactly are we going to measure? Are you going to measure compliance with the indications? Remember the five moments of hand hygiene from the World Health Organization? Those are indications for hand hygiene. Are you going to measure all five? Are you just going to measure gel in, gel out, like most of us do? So you really have to be very specific about what it is you're measuring. Are you going to look at the structural components, that is, where your sinks are available, where are they placed? Do you have paper towels available? Are all the soap dispensers full? These are structural components of hand hygiene. Do you want to measure product usage? That is product selection. When are, they, are people using soap when they ought to? Are they using alcohol-based hand rub when they, when they should? How much product are they using? Are they applying the product correctly? Is the product located where it needs to be? Um, maybe you want to look at adherence, like are people wearing artificial nails when they shouldn't be? Are they actually washing their hands for the full 15 to 20 seconds? Um, are they, um, you know, other policies that you're looking at? You could also might just want to, you might want to know what is their attitude about hand hygiene and how much do they know? Do they know the appropriate technique? And that brings us to competence. In your, when you're measuring hand hygiene, and if you're just looking at gel in, gel out, are you looking to see that that is done correctly or just that somebody got a good squirt in the palm of their hand? Then the last thing you want to, not even the last thing, but one, another thing you want to think about is stratification. So do you want to know just in general how well people are adhering to hand hygiene, or do you want to know anesthesia providers versus surgeons versus RNs versus your OB docs? Do you want to know anesthesia providers in surgery versus anesthesia providers over in labor and delivery? I mean, there's, you know, how do you stratify this for the best purpose of why you're measuring hand hygiene? So, again, you're starting to see how this is not as easy as we all think that it is, and a thoughtful approach will make a big difference. So once you've decided what you're going to measure and why you're measuring it, how? How are you going to measure? So there's a lot. There are a couple of, well, there's four current methods that have been validated. Um, observation, so whether you're doing overt, meaning somebody is just kind of walking around shadowing the nurses and the doctors watching for hand hygiene and maybe they're doing some coaching when someone misses, you get a little reminder to grab the gel. Or are you doing secret shoppers where people don't know that they're being, being watched and monitored. Um, there's, you get different data depending on which method you choose. Another way is to measure product, and this the metric you get from that is the number of le or the yes number of liters of product used per patient day. So this is a kind of a rough cut, um, an estimate of what's being used, but it is it has been validated and is acceptable by surveyors as a way to measure hand hygiene practices. I've tried this. I did this with a, a home health agency. It's a lot of fun, but it was a Doing the math was a little bit of work, too, so there's pros and cons, and we're going to talk about pros and cons in just a minute. Another thing you might think about is just surveying. You can send out a survey to your staff and just ask them about their knowledge, attitude, and have them do a self-assessment, kind of get an idea of um, what they think about hand hygiene. Or you can survey your patients. You know, we do have, there's a couple of questions on the HCAP survey about, you know, did your provider take care of your safety by washing their hands and, and wearing gloves. So that's kind of a proxy measure, um, but it is a possibility if that's what you need to do. And then there's a lot of new fancy electronic monitoring where you put a little device either on the alcohol-based hand rub or on the sinks and it will read people's badges and know whether or not they've performed hand hygiene appropriately. So let's look at some of the pros um, of each of these, these um, method. So observation, you can get really good data from observation. You can watch people do it. You know exactly who's washing and who's not washing, how well they're washing. Um, and it's the most reliable method for the most part. Product usage, it's really efficient because you don't have to stand there. You don't have any FTEs. I mean, that is people hours watching other people wash their hands. It's not subject to any kind of bias. And by bias, we think about, you know, when, when you have people doing observation, what happens sometimes is they, they only catch people when they're washing their hands. So they see them wash the hands and they count that as, um, you know, uh, compliance versus being able to watch 
people in advance and, and follow them through. So with product usage, there's no bias. Um, it is a lot less time consuming if you do it correctly, and it can be less, less costly. The survey, of course, is really inexpensive. It's not that resource intensive, but we know that um, healthcare workers, you know, they may overestimate their actual hand hygiene, so it's not particularly reliable. And then the electronic um, is a pretty good method. It seems to be effective when you can get real-time data and you can get that fed back to the, in, to the um, individual people pretty quickly. Um, but there's always some drawbacks. So with observation, we talk about the Hawthorne effect. That is, if people know they're being watched, they're going to change their behavior, which may be okay if you, you know, if you're set out to say we want to do this overt observation with coaching because we can guarantee people are washing their hands. That's one way to look at it. But then what happens when you're not around? We don't really, there's a big question mark there. Um, we also know, it's, of course, it's very costly. It requires training. We also don't know if there's a lot of what we call inter-rater reliability. So if I'm watching hand hygiene and someone else is watching hand hygiene, would we get the exact same answers to the questions? Would we come up with the same rate? Um, that still is very challenging on how you train your observers. Product usage, it's an aggregate measure. You have no idea whether it's actually um, being used for the purpose that we think it is. If it spills on the floor, it looks like you had a lot of hand hygiene occur when, in fact, you just wasted the, the um, product. Um, and the validity is still a little bit questionable. So it is an acceptable method, but it is very hard to corroborate with what you actually see. Surveys, you know, again, pretty easy to do, but may or may not be all that accurate. And then the electronic version of monitoring is pretty good. And I don't know if any of you have this in your system. We'd love to hear from you if you do, but we understand it's very, very expensive. We're also hearing that there's a lot of maintenance issues with these systems and um, that it may, it may malfunction. Um, so if, especially if you have like two people in the room and it doesn't know which badge to read. And then sometimes the staff just don't really like knowing that they're being big brothered, and I put that in air quotes, um, for these automatic radio frequency type monitoring systems. So you really need to be very thoughtful about how you measure your hand hygiene. Generally people do observations, and um, the metric that you're looking for is your adherence rate. And we talked to before about, you know, when you see someone wash their hands, that that would be a compliant moment. So you're, when you're when you're doing this, it is the number of observed hand hygiene events, people actually washing their hands or using alcohol-based hand rub, divided by the total number of opportunities that were presented during that observation moment. And so as you can see, if we watch nine people wash their hands, um, but there were 15 times when they sh should have washed their hands, you would end up with a 60% adherence rate. So it looks like we had a question come in from Laura Showers. It says, do we really need to replicate uh, the requirements? Most of those references are hundreds of pages long. I write a procedure that applies to my setting and reference the guidelines. I don't copy and paste. Do I need to start doing that? Now, you don't necessarily need to start doing that, but you do need to state up front, Laura, that we follow the CDC guidelines as found in the MMWR 2002. Um, and then you just want to make sure that your procedures are um, following those guidelines and that all of your staff have access to that guideline. So if that's what you're referencing, everybody needs the ability to, to get to it. Um, and then Rachel says, do you have a sample survey that you feel has effective or well-worded questions? I think that there are some out there on the CDC website, but I'll make a note and see if we can, if we can find something for you. So to conclude the hand hygiene part of this, webinar, it, it, it is hard. Hand, measuring hand hygiene is really difficult, and you need to be thoughtful about why you're doing it, again, what you're going to be measuring, who's going to be doing it, who's going to be measured, you know, who's the recipient, um, and then what are you going to do with the data? So as infection preventionists, this is your call, and you can make recommendations, and you need to maybe bring everybody together for a multidisciplinary discussion. Um, about what it is you're trying to achieve and how you'll use them. Otherwise, you end up just 
doing these really expensive observations and all that data just gets posted on a bulletin board that nobody ever looks at and you have this perpetual useless information that's just out there. All right, so let's follow up with a quiz. Mary Beth, you want to open that poll for us? All right, all of the following methods for measuring hand hygiene adherence are acceptable, except A, using electronic systems to continuously monitor hand hygiene over time and automatically download data for analysis, monitoring the volume of gloves used per 1,000 patient days, C, monitoring adherence to artificial artificial fingernail policy, or D, conducting observational studies to determine the rate of adherence by a ward or a service line. So take a second and let's, um, let's open up the, the poll here. I think it's already open. Select your best answer and we'll see what we think. Pa Paul is answering the, question, the, the poll on our side over here. <laughs> We might need to train Paula in hand hygiene <laughs> adherence measuring. <laughs> so think about that. And I just and I do want to say that um, you know these are these are questions that uh, if you're going to be taking the certification exam, you may see something very similar similar to the these questions. Although I tried to pick the easy ones for this webinar. All right. So. Um, Mary Beth, how much time left? 20 seconds. 20 seconds, okay. So do we have any other questions that have come in while we're waiting for the poll to close? Okay, so let's see if we've learned a lot about um, this. So most of you are correct. So 75% of you did say that monitoring gloves is not the appropriate method, and that is correct. So again, we talked about um, the other one that came in. It looks like monitoring adherence to artificial fingernail policy. Um, no, you you can do that if that's if that's a problem for you. You're, that's remember that category of adherence to policy. So you you can do that as a an acceptable method. So great job, guys. One really good. This D conducting observational studies. That is, we call it a study, but that is your secret shoppers going out there and collecting data. All right, let me see if I can claim to change this. Let's talk about personal protective equipment. Here are your guidelines um, that you'll really need to know about for writing your policies. Um, we, we introduced the guideline for isolation precautions in our last webinar, but you also want to take a look at the OSHA standard on bloodborne pathogens, and you want to take a look at, in Washington State at least, the administrative code for bloodborne pathogens and the Washington administrative code for personal protective equipment. If you're outside of the state of Washington, you might want to check with your own um, administrative codes to see if there's anything guiding um, type, this type of work in hospitals. Okay, so when, you're gonna, when you measure your personal protective equipment practices as an infection preventionist, team up with your employee health person. Now, I know that many of you in critical access hospitals, you are the employee health person, so take yourself to lunch. Talk to yourself about how do you measure PPE, because again, like hand hygiene, this can be challenging. So in, in Washington State, at least, we are required to conduct an annual PPE risk assessment or a hazard analysis, and basically this is um, where you take every job description that's in your hospital and you find out what kind of jobs each one of those people does. And then you figure out what kind of PPE you need to have available for each of those job classifications. So that's the first thing is knowing, knowing who's at risk and do they have the ability to get the PPE that they need, where they need it, and when they need it. Um, so help with that if you get a chance. Um, then you also want to take a look at your OSHA logs. So any of your needle sticks or your incident reports, like if you get an incident report, for example, in your ED from the radiology tech that says, oh, this person came in with um, norovirus and he vomited all over my feet and then the next day I got sick. So you may see some incident reports showing that illness or something 
um, some event that it, it turned into after exposure, it became an illness, or even just the exposure itself. But when you do the root cause analysis, you find out that that person could have used PPE to protect themselves, or that they should have known and chose not to. So these are ways that you look at, what are, was this a preventable exposure? So one of the ways you can measure PPE use is looking at the total number of preventable exposures that were not prevented because of the PPE and then begin to close that gap a little bit. Um, you also want to make sure as the infection preventionist that you're educating staff on what the risks are and when they don't use PPE and then how to appropriately don and doff their gowns, their masks, um, their gloves. We learned a lot from Ebola. That we learned that even though we have 50% of our patients in contact isolation, uh, we were not taking off and putting on our PPE correctly. Um, and when it became really life-threatening with Ebola, we had some remedial actions we had to take. So this is a perfect opportunity for you to teach people how to take off their PPE without contaminating themselves. You also want to t teach them about respiratory etiquette. So if they come to work with a cough or if they're taking care of a patient with a cough, somebody needs to have a mask on, whether it's the employee or the patient. Um, as infection preventionist, you may also want to be the one that takes care of documenting those PPE competencies, or you want to make sure that the nurse managers and other people um, are looking at PPE competencies. So if you have a skills fair day, this can be a lot of fun, um, getting people to put on and take off gowns, gloves, masks without contaminating themselves. Glow powder is a really good, fun tool you can use with this because you'll see that it is almost impossible to take off gloves without contaminating your hands in the process. So think about that for Skills Fair Day. Um, and then when you walk through the hospital doing your rounds, check to see that PPE is available. So if you have people in contact isolation, go through those cart drawers, make sure that it's well stocked, that they have what they need at the place that they need it, because that's really critical for compliance. So standard precautions, let's talk a little bit about environmental practices um, that you may be interested in as an infection preventionist. So here we go, next quiz. I know these are taking a little bit long, but I think it reinforces some of the, the concepts that we're, we're learning. So all of the following may be indications of a heating, ventilation, and air condition malfunction, except A, an increase in the post-op SSI rate, that's surgical site infections. B, a single case of aspergillosis in a severely immunosuppressed patient. C, a healthcare-associated varicella infection. Or D, an outbreak of ventilator-associated acinetobacter infection in the ICU. So take a minute, figure out which of these might indicate that you have a problem with your HVAC system. As infection preventionists, this is, this is something you seriously want to think about when you're looking at your outcomes and what kind of infections you have and thinking about what are the sources of contamination in my hospital. Paula, Paula wants to answer the question. All right, Paula. So again, um, an increase in the post-op surgical site infection rate is A, B, a, sing, a single case of aspergillosis in an immunocompromised patient, C, healthcare-associated varicella infections, or D, an outbreak of ventilator-associated acinetobacter infection in the ICU. All right, how much time do we have? About 20, 20 seconds. 20 more seconds, okay. So these questions can be kind of fun. I hope you're enjoying them. This is our first time to try it. Uh, do let us know if you appreciate or don't appreciate this part of the, the webinar. And here we go. Okay. Oh, so this one was more challenging, wasn't it? Okay, so. So let me go through these with you so we understand the rationale. So anytime that you have a surgical site infection rate that goes up, 
Um, even though it says post-operative, we don't mean necessarily post-discharge. We just mean that it is an SSI. And you do need to think about what is the air quality in your operating room. So not only are you looking at HVAC, you're looking at post, do you have positive pressure? Um, and, you know, are all the vents, have they been cleaned appropriately? So you do want to look at HVAC for, for SSI rates. For B, a single case of aspergillosis, this, this is an, a, a severely immunocompromised patient. So they are going to pick up uh, anything that's floating in the air. And aspergillus is one of those things that indicates that you probably do have either some sort of um, disruption of the dust that's in the air, like you do construction or remodel, maybe even from a construction site down the, that's across the street, but the wind is blowing just right. Um, so you do want to think about how well is your HVAC system filtering that air. See, healthcare-associated varicella infection. Varicella is airborne, and uh, if you have healthcare-associated, particularly with a cluster, you really want to look at how you're doing your air handling. So the answer to this one is D, an outbreak of ventilator-associated acinetobacter, because in this case, the, this is a device-associated. So the first thing you want to really look at is the ventilator and what's happening there and have all of the bundle practices been put into place. So not related to the HVAC system, but, but more so to the ventilator. So I hope that that is helpful to you um, and that we've learned a little bit. These are your guidelines for environmental practices. Again, isolation precautions, we'll talk a little bit about it. But the big granddaddy of all guidelines is this environmental infection control in healthcare facilities. I think it's like 300 pages, but it's very nicely broken down into sections. So you'll see a section on air quality, section on water, section on housekeeping, section on sterilization. So there's a lot of really good information. Don't try to eat the whole thing in one weekend, though. So take it one step at a time and, and to look at air, like just your air quality stuff. Let, let yourself digest that one. And then, you know, a couple days later, maybe go back and look at the next section. But this is the one that is very, very influential in the world of infection prevention. And then if you have linen being processed in your hospital, and not many hospitals do this anymore, um, but if you're doing your own laundry, you do want to look at the Healthcare Laundry Accreditation Council. They have a lot of good standards on how to safely and appropriately process laundry, water temperature, what PPE the laundry people need to be wearing, and so forth. So check those out. All right, so how is the infection preventionist, are you supposed to know all of this information about the environment? Maybe you are a registered nurse, maybe you're a lab tech. Uh, you know, not many of us have been up on the roof of our hospitals with a hard hat, climbing the ladder in our little dresses with the plant ops people to know how the air condition works. If you get a chance to do that, though, it's a lot of fun. You should, you should try that. My recommendation is that you go get to know those folks that are in charge of those different areas. So go get a lot of Starbucks cards or your coffee shop or meet them in the cafeteria and buy them lunch because these people are going to be good friends, and you really need to make sure you have a good trusting relationship with those managers. So this includes your housekeeping lead, uh, your facility plant ops people. I can't stress how wonderful it is to have a good relationship with your facilities manager. Um, I can also tell you if you don't have a good relationship with your facilities manager that your life and your job becomes pretty hard. So be nice to those folks. Laundry, nutrition, central supply, these are all people who know their stuff. They have their own professional associations, and many of them already know a lot about infection control. So what you want to do is get to know each one. You want to visit them at least once a year so that you can go through some practices with them, make sure you've got your checklist going um, so that you, you know what the risks are in those areas. Um, but ask them to orient you. Say, show me around. Teach me what you do. Help me understand. And many of them really will. So set up an hour appointment to walk around with them and let them teach you. At the same time, you want to be sure that you've already read your guidelines, that HICPAC guidelines, so that you, you know what you're looking for when you're there as far as infection prevention goes. The other thing you can do is attend the staff meetings of these departments. So go to your, your housekeeping staff meeting. It's a really good opportunity for them to get to know you and for you to get to know them. You can provide basic education while you're there about infection control. And um, what we know is that 
often these people really do want to do the right thing and are very concerned about infection control. And having you speak one-on-one -on -one with them or be at that meeting, developing those relationships, it gives them an opportunity to ask you questions and to share their concerns. And so suddenly you will have you'll have a lot of extra eyes and hands doing infection control work if they trust you and they know what, what your priorities are. Um, the other thing is when you get the guidelines and you're going to go visit an area, use those guidelines to create your own little checklist. So when you're doing your annual rounds, you have a systematic way of saying, yes, I've checked this and it's compliant. Um, or, oh, this doesn't look right, Get you know, have the manager of that department look at it with you and together decide whether that's something that needs to be prioritized for, in, for improvement. Um, and then the other thing is really encourage those managers of those departments to do self-assessments based on their own, um, their own guidelines and professional standards. So you can provide them with some infection control resources and they can provide you with some resources on their um, line of work, and together you create a really great team and you begin to understand what the risks are in each of those areas. So that as infection preventionists, you really, really need good relationships there. Now, as an infection preventionist, you can't delegate all of this. So things that you really need to be concerned about is checking to make sure that your negative pressure room, that the pressures are checked every day if you have a patient in that room. Um, not just any patient, but like a patient that needs to be in negative pressure because maybe you're ruling out tuberculosis. Um, that's the main one is tuberculosis. So every day you need to make sure you're checking the pressures and that everything is working well. Uh, leaks and water damage. This is a very special infection prevention problem um, in a lot of hospitals because people don't know to report it to you. So there's a leak over the weekend. Um, that that area needs to be able to be dried within 48 to 72 hours or the whole thing needs to be removed. And there's, there is some guidance in, in those HICBAC um, documents that will help you with that. But um, spread the word that if you, anybody, anybody sees water damage, they need to let you know pretty quickly so that you can monitor and make sure that that is appropriately remediated. Of course, we, we'll talk later this year about how to do an infection control risk assessment. That's the ICRA you see there for construction and renovation. Utility outages, you need to make sure that people have safe water. Um, if there's a, an outage, what's happening with your, like your um, HVAC system, if you have a power outage, hopefully you have a backup generator, but you need to really check on those special populations like negative pressure room, positive pressure room, OR. Um, you also want to make sure that um, anytime you have new equipment that comes into your hospital that you're on that product review committee. So lobby to get on there if you're not already there because it's a whole lot easier up front to ask your manufacturer to, to guarantee that the, the um, cleaning product that you're using will work with their product than after you buy it. Because once it's in, in your hospital, you have to follow the manufacturer's guidelines and it may be that they require some special um, cleaning solution that you've never even heard of, much less be able to actually follow. So it's better to look at it up front. Get on that committee. And then, of course, environmental services. You want to make sure that you're watching um, occasionally um, and fairly regularly that, that those terminal cleans are being done appropriately. Um, and the good news is in March, we're going, so March 22nd, we're going to offer a webinar on environmental services, so be looking for that. Safe injection practices. We have a quiz. I know we're running out of time, so uh, we're not going to open this poll up. Mary Beth, I don't know if this is going to cause you a problem, but um, we'll just kind of go through this one. So the, this one says, the IP designs an education program to review safe injection practices with all nursing staff. These practices include all except, A, use single-dose vials whenever possible and avoid using multi-dose vials, B, discard saline bags used for IV flushes for multiple patients after one hour, enter medication vials with a new needle and new syringe even on the same patient, and use needles and syringes for only one patient. So I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to say that the correct answer to this one is B, discard saline bags used for IV flushes for multiple patients after one hour. Um, the key word here is multiple patients, so never, ever, ever use IV flushes for more than one patient. Um, I recently heard a story about um, some money-saving activities where a nurse was flushing um, IVs 
with a 10 cc syringe because you only really need two cc's but she was going from patient to patient um, flushing with two cc's so um, that I'm sure caused a lot of angst within that hospital um, and having to do that um, investigation so the other thing we a use single dose files whenever possible in hospitals I think we do tend to do that uh, with the exception of maybe insulin and so forth um, C is intermedication vials with a new needle and a new syringe, even on the same patient. That is absolutely true. And use needles and syringes for only one patient. Um, again, watch for those reuse of syringes. That can be a problem. Here are your guidelines, and these these slides are available to you. Um, we can we've sent them out to those that were registered. We have them available on our. Um, SharePoint site, and if you need a copy, let me know. I'll send them to you. What I want to draw your attention to is this brand new APIC white paper on injection, infusion, and medication vial practices in healthcare. This did come out several years ago, but they just updated it this year. And uh, we're very lucky in our APIC chapter here in, in the Seattle area because two of the authors of those of that paper are members of our chapter. And, and if you have any questions, we can hook you up with um, either Patrick uh, Marsha Patrick or um, uh, Gwen Felizardo, who are the authors there. But here's the, the link to it. Okay, what I want to let you know as an infection preventionist is use the checklist, and you need to monitor every area. So this is the CMS surveyor's worksheet, nice little already a checklist for you. You can also use the one and only campaign checklist. Very, very pretty, nicely done here, uh, pretty simple to use. As infection preventionists, Make sure that your policy outlines those new, the new practices that you'll see in the APIC paper, because uh, we're finding that there's more and more outbreaks associated with unsafe injection practices, particularly in an outpatient setting. So educate people, but as IPs, you need to assess every single area that you normally wouldn't think about. So you need to get out there to your clinics if you have any. You need to go look in pharmacy. You need to go check out what's happening in surgery radiology, the infusion center, anybody that's using a needle or um, administering medications, please go check to make sure that they are not using single dose vials for multiple patients, that there's no accidental um, re uh, contamination of the vials by re-entering with the, a, a used syringe, that they're not using flushes for multiple patients. Look at every area. If you see it, you need to stop the line. This is an immediate jeopardy situation. Stop the line right then. This is a serious finding. You need to notify the leadership, notify your risk manager, because at that point you need to find out, is this a one-off thing? Like uh, I've seen in, a, in an ambulatory setting where um, like the, the Versed used for a colonoscopy was not wasted appropriately but left on the, the Mayo Clinic. A new nurse took over the second case and thought, Oh, look, the nurse before me was so nice to draw up the Versed for me, and they used that same syringe. So that was a one-off. The, the risk was very low because we knew who the source patient was. They knew who the, the patient was that got the second dose from that same syringe, so that was not a huge problem. But if it looks like it's an ongoing practice, that this is just how we do, we always use a flush bag for all of our infusion patients, it's common, you probably need to notify your local health district to help with that investigation, but do get your leadership involved immediately. Cannot stress this enough. We're seeing it everywhere in unsafe injection practices. Okay, um, standard precautions, again, transmission. We talked a lot about this last time, so we're just gonna talk a little bit more about what your role is. And here's a quiz. The RN is caring for a patient in the emergency department with symptoms consistent with flu. What precautions should she use? A, standard, B, standard in droplet, C, airborne, or D, droplet if influenza is confirmed. So I think a lot of people would probably choose D, droplet if influenza is confirmed, but really the answer on this one is standard in droplet because uh, we know that the sensitivity of flu, um, flu tests is maybe not, you know, we know it's not 100%. So even though they may say that they, it may come back negative, it doesn't mean they didn't have flu. And the other thing is, it really doesn't matter. If someone has symptoms consistent with flu, they're sick. So um, you don't want that transmitted to anybody. And so that nurse needs to be wearing a mask if that patient has 
these types of symptoms. And of course, we use standard precautions with every patient. So here are your guidelines for transmission-based precautions, the same one from the last webinar that we had. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about your policy because um, this, is, this is really important. A lot of people in hospitals, because of we don't want MRSA, and we don't want C. diff, and we don't want VRE, we're putting half of our patients into isolation. But what we know from the literature and from our own experiences is that patients in isolation are often harmed because um, they're left alone and they may or may not have been educated correctly. So they have higher rates of depression, they have higher rates of adverse events, they have lower satisfaction rates, and they often experience delay in care. And that means that, and you, you can totally understand this because as doctors are going through making their rounds and they're deciding who needs to be discharged or who needs orders written on them, oftentimes they don't want to have to stop and gown and garb all the PPE on in order to go in to see the patient. So that what they say to themselves is, I'm going to go see this other patient first really quickly and get them discharged and then I'll come back. But what happens then is they go to see the next patient, the next patient, and then they'll, they might wait to see those isolation patients later and later and later in the day, which leads to delay in care and treatment. Uh, we also know that RNs do less eyeballing of their patients if they have to put on the gown and glove, gloves um, every time they go in. So we do see higher rates of falls and other um, failure to recognize sepsis or an event that can, can be otherwise prevented. So having said that, knowing that patients in isolation can be harmed, you know, what do we do about it? Because the, on balance, we want to prevent MDROs. So I want to encourage you to take a multidisciplinary risk assessment approach to creating your policy. Because we see policies that say, who goes into isolation? Well, anybody that has an active infection, anybody who's ever exposed to an active infection who's likely to come down with it may be in isolation. People who are colonized are in isolation. If you had a history of infection with a multi-drug resistant organism, you're isolated. If you had history of colonization with any of these, you're isolated. Um, we also know if you have active surveillance cultures, people are put into isolation if they come back positive. Um, and then all of this is done without a real sense of what is the likelihood of transmission. Now, it may be that you have in your hospital um, a raging problem with nosocomial transmission of C. difficile, in which case you probably do want to put all those people, whether they're colonized or had a history, into isolation. That may be appropriate. But I know m many of you haven't seen a C. diff case in two or more years. So does it make sense to put those people in isolation um, based on um, – you know, that they were colonized years ago back in Dyson. I don't know. You have to do the risk assessment, and this is what we're, we're thinking about. And, and um, MRSA is the other one. So C. Diff, C. diff, I think, does probably need to be isolated. But MDROs, think about MRSA and VRE, and be rational about your approach on that. So when you're doing that risk assessment, you want to look at your data on hand hygiene and PPE, at e, PPE adherence, because we know, too, that the more patients that you have in isolation, the less adherent to those isolation precautions the staff are. So, you, again, you want to balance and want to know how, how much are, are people really tying their, their gowns and wearing their gloves. You want to know, do you have, you know, what are your rates of MRSA, whether it's hospital onset or community acquired? Because if you don't have any really happening, then why go overboard? Or you may say, no, we don't want to have any and we want to keep it out. So it, again, Think about it rationally. Um, we do know that there's really no debate. So if you suspect that you have an active case of C. diff, uh, put that person in isolation until you know otherwise. If your patient has diarrhea of unknown origin, particularly if they're incontinent, it's probably a good idea to put them in isolation so that people aren't contaminating their clothing. If, you have a sudden, if your patient has sudden onset vomiting or diarrhea, Put them in isolation. Wounds with drainage that can't be contained. So we're talking about those big wounds like pressure ulcers. Those, probably, those folks need to be in isolation. 
Um, and then any of those infections that are listed on Appendix A of the HICPAC guidelines, and we talked about that last time, and here's a screenshot for it. Uh, Appendix A will list out all of the different conditions that you may experience, the type of um, isolation precautions, how long those precautions need to be in place, and any particular notes. So if they're on here, you do want to follow that guideline. Measuring isolation practices, again, as the IP, you're reviewing your daily labs, making sure who needs to be in isolation is according to your policy. Verify that, the doc in the, that you have documented when that patient went into isolation because if there are exposures, this will help you a lot to know how much, how much time elapsed where the patient was infectious and the time that we discovered it and put them in isolation. So make sure whenever you can in the medical record that the nurses have documented the date and time of isolation. And then when you're out there on the units walking through, maybe go on your way to the cafeteria, swing through, um, are, are all the patients appropriately isolated? Is the sign on the door, is the cart well stocked? Are they wearing their PPE before they go in? Did they discard it? Um, and make sure that there's no PPE worn in the halls. Don't let, don't let folks walk through the hall with gloves on because you don't know whether those are clean or dirty. Um, and that all of the equipment that's used in the room is either disposable or cleaned between patients. So, um, that was a whirlwind tour of your role as infection prevention. I know we didn't cover all of it, um, and, and we're, we're close to the top of the hour, but I do want to answer any questions that you have. But again, the take-home points are know your guidelines, review your policies, try to be systematic and objective in collecting data on compliance and outcomes, and then use all that to really assess the risks to know what you need to work on for improvement. So with that, Mary Beth, if you'll um, open lines to us for um, questions or comments, we're happy to take them. All right, ladies and gentlemen, just use the raised hand icon located at the bottom right of the panel where you see your name, and we will unmute you one at a time for questions. Jamie, I don't see any questions at this time. Wow, I, bet, I wonder if people are still awake. Okay, that's I wouldn't blame them if they weren't. Um, so thank you. I hope this was helpful. Um, you can email me any questions that you have, and we also can share your questions with our local APIC group with experienced IPs and others. You're also welcome to share with the other equip members so that you get the, the critical access hospital perspective on those. So please, all of those are um, available to you. When you... Um, close this out, there's a survey, so let us know if you liked the quiz questions. I think the, you know, it went a little bit long, but it uh, might have been helpful to you to reinforce the knowledge. If it wasn't helpful, we want to hear that too. And again, um, next month in March, we're going we're gonna to do a webinar on environmental services housekeeping and uh, the infection prevention. So I'm trying to get a, a speaker for you on that one, and um, we're happy to take your questions. All right. Thank you all very much.